Hi everyone. Okay, so this is National 5 Weather Systems. I'm going to take you through the entire unit in one go. Um, so, yeah, it's going to it's going to follow quite a lot of detail, and um, I'm going to move through four key question areas. One, climate factors. Two, air masses. Three, depressions, and four, anticyclones. Okay, so let's get started. First of all, climate factors. Once I've finished talking you through this, what you should do is take notes from the screen based on the model answer I'm going to show you. The typical question will show you a map of Britain in some form and ask you to explain the variations in temperature that Britain receives. There are um, some key, um, five key things that uh, affect the temperature. The first is A for altitude. You don't just have to know that altitude affects temperature, but you need to know that as you go higher, it gets colder. So from the map on the right, you can see that the higher ground is um, going to have uh, colder temperatures because of altitude. L for latitude. The nearer we go to the equator, the more the sun's rays are concentrated on the surface of the earth, making it warmer. As you can see on the map, the further south we go towards the equator, the warmer it gets because of latitude. O is for ocean currents. Ocean currents are movements within the ocean, um, almost uh, rivers of water within the ocean, and they bring warm and cold water to different parts of the planet. Britain has a warm ocean current moving past it called the North Atlantic Drift and as a result this brings warmth to the west coast of Britain. If you look at the map you can see that the west coast of Britain has many more red areas than uh, especially in the north than the east. Compare the northeast to the northwest. So the uh, west coast of Britain receives warmth from the North Atlantic Drift. O oh, for ocean currents. Heat islands. Heat islands um, are because of cities. Cities generate a huge amount of heat through industry, transport, etc. People's homes, for example, re release a lot of heat. And these cause concentrations of higher temperatures, as you can see down in uh, the south east around London, for example. And finally, A for aspect. Aspect is the direction that a slope faces. So, for example, uh, if you're on a hill that is facing south, you're going to receive more sunlight, so it will be warmer. Houses that are built on south-facing slopes are generally worth more because they'll have sunny gardens. Try and learn Aloha. A-L-O-H-A. -O Altitude, latitude, ocean currents, heat islands, and aspect. Okay, that's that question completely dealt with. The next area of the course that you need to have um, competency with is um, is coming up actually. I just want to show you uh, a couple of examples here. So here you can see that we here's an exam question. Explain the factors which av which affect average temperatures in the UK. You would have to use Aloha, altitude, latitude, ocean currents, heat islands, and aspect to explain the variations in temperature. As you can see, um, scoring marks, I'm, I'm using uh, the system I've just described to you to score marks. Here's another example of a question explaining the factors which cause variations in temperature. Notice that the map is different, but the, the stem of the question is the same. You need to use Aloha, altitude, latitude, ocean current, heat island, and aspect to score full marks. All right. The next area of knowledge is in station circles. Now, station circles sometimes um, are an exam question on their own, as you can see on the screen, but are more useful to you when being used in combination with other question types. In this question, you're just asked to draw a station circle, and that's really quite easy. Um, so use the table on the right-hand side to revise this. Basically, all station circles start with a circle, as you can see. And then you add various features from the three columns. You've got the precipitation column, which shows something, anything to do with moisture in the air, the amount of cloud cover, 
and the wind speed and the wind direction. So uh, in this instance, we've got a northerly wind. So the tail on the circle comes from the north. Uh, the wind is 30 knots. Well, a short tail feather is 5 knots. A long tail feather is 10. Combine them and you get 15. Combine two long ones, you get 20. So three long ones would make 30 knots. You can make combinations of these symbols. So for example, snow plus a triangle makes a snow shower. And it doesn't matter where on the diagram you draw them, by the way. It doesn't have to be in the bottom left. Just anywhere around the circle will do. Um, and then sky obscured, which is the crossed out symbol down here. Um, for four marks, actually, this is a really generous question, um, but it would require you to know all of these symbols. A little tip, when you're dealing with the cloud cover, zero clouds is a blank circle. One uh, octa, that means one eighth of the sky covered, is a line. Two eighths is a quarter, and so you colour a quarter in. Three eighths is a quarter plus one, so we draw a line. Four eighths is a half, so we colour half the circle in. Five eighths is a um, is four plus one, so we add a line. Sixth eighths is three quarters, so you colour it three quarters in. Now, seven eighths, we can't add a line to this one, so what we do is we split it down the middle and put uh, a white stripe down the middle of the circle. Eight eighths, of course, is a hole, so we colour the whole circle in. And the sky obscured to whatever measuring device we're using is a crossed out circle. Uh, this question uh, demonstrates that you do need to know these symbols, so make sure that you spend some time learning them. All right, on to air masses. This map from the Met Office shows um, the, fi the, the key air masses that affect Britain. Um, there is polar maritime air. Now, normally we would just consider this as one air mass. On this diagram, it's divided into two. Arctic Maritime, Polar Continental, Tropical Continental, and Tropical Maritime. The key things you need to know are that the ones that start with the word polar or arctic are cold. And the ones that start with tropical are warm. That's not difficult to remember. The ones that end with maritime, or have maritime in their name, are moist air masses. They carry moisture. The ones that, start, that end with or include the word term continental are dry, and that's because air masses that move over land um, get dried out. And air masses that move over the sea absorb moisture from the sea and become wet. All right. There are three kind of things you need to know in revising these. So I'm going to break them down into warm air masses and then cold air masses. You need to be able to describe the characteristics of an air mass. So a TM air mass is tropical maritime, which means it is warm and moist. A TC is tropical continental, and it's warm and dry. You may need to explain the conditions that they bring. TM comes from the south, so it's warm, and passes over and picks up moisture from the sea. I'm explaining here why it is warm and moist. Again, here I'm explaining, and for the tropical continental air mass, why it's warm, because it comes from the south, and why it's dry, because it passes over North Africa. You also may need to describe the impact that they have upon people. So, for example, a tropical air mass um, will bring pleasant weather for tourism. Beaches may become overcrowded. A classic mark that many people remember is that ice cream sales will increase. It's also worth noting some negatives. Elderly can suffer from heat stroke in hot conditions, and there may be hosepipe bans for people in their gardens. This is really quite kind of straightforward stuff, and a bit of common sense will guide you with this question. Uh, it's worth more time revising what the names of the air masses are and why the air masses are like they are. For cold air masses, the same system applies. Learn to describe the air masses, to explain the air masses, and then talk about how they might impact upon people. Pause the video here to go or go back slightly and take these notes and spend time with them, learning them, especially question one and question two. Question three 
is more kind of obvious, but it's certainly worth time reading through. That takes us on to depressions. We're going to start with a little video clip here, guys. Okay, so a brief introduction to depressions there, showing the movement between, um, the interaction, I should say, between warm air and cold air. Uh, as we look at this animation, we can look at a warm front in more detail. A warm front is essentially where the warm air is following some cold air. And the warm air, because it is lighter, because it's warm, rises up over the cold air as it rises up over the cold air, it uh, condenses into clouds and you'll get rain. Now, as we're about to see in a cold front, in a cold front you'll see that um, the, 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 the warm air is pushed up much more rapidly and aggressively. And so uh, clouds form more rapidly, the clouds become thicker and the rain becomes heavier. At a warm front, the um, warm air is chasing the cold air from left to right on your screen and so the warm air gradually climbs up over the cold air and we get gradual cloud formation and we get showers of rain. At a cold front we get cold air chasing warm air. Now the cold air is heavy so it sinks and it cuts under the warm air and so you can see that the warm air is forced up more rapidly and aggressively creating thicker, heavier cloud and heavy rain. You may be taught about occluded fronts as well. Now, occluded fronts are simply where a cold uh, front, as you can see moving from the left, actually catches up with a warm front. And this lifts the warm sector in between up into the sky. Uh, this causes rapid uh, condensation, the most rapid condensation, huge dense cloud masses and very heavy sustained rainfall. Now, you'll notice I've gone through that quite quickly because there's a lot of theoretical thinking behind depressions, but it's actually easier in videos such as this just to deal with the practicalities of how to answer the questions. So let's focus on that. The questions vary a great deal. That's the, uh, the first thing to know. Here are some broad guidelines as to how the questions will phrase themselves. You're either going to be asked to describe and explain the weather currently taking place at a location at this moment in time, or you may be at number two described, asked to describe and explain 
the weather that will take place over a period of time, typically 24 hours at a location on the map. Thirdly, there are some questions that ask you to compare two different locations and kind of spot the differences. I should point out this asterisk here, which these questions routinely make use of station circles. So that station circle uh, lesson I was giving earlier in this video is one to really pay attention to because it's very likely that you're going to use them in some form or another. Here's a first example of a depression question. You're asked to decide which weather chart, X or Y, is more likely to show the conditions shown on this map. Notice that there are station circles to deal with. Only one of the weather charts can be correct. Pause the video and see if you can figure out which one you think is correct. Notice that Glasgow has very heavy cloud, heavy rain, lots of wind. Um, Manchester has less cloud and warmer temperatures and less wind. And London has cloud but not as heavy as Glasgow, warmer temperatures, some showers and again less wind. So we need to now compare them to these maps. In map Y, Glasgow is in the warm sector, the area between the warm front and the cold front. Manchester is in front of the warm front and London is just behind the warm front. Now, in this scenario, London should have warm temperatures because it's in the warm sector. So should Glasgow because it's in the warm sector. Um, but Glasgow has a cold temperature. Also, Glasgow has very heavy cloud and very heavy rain. Let's look at map X. London is at the warm front where we would expect to see showers and warmer temperatures. Warmer temperatures, showers. Manchester is in the middle of the warm sector. And so we would expect to see warmer temperatures. See over there, five is a warmer temperature compared to the other three. Um, there may be some cloud, but there'll be less of it, again, reflected in the station circles. And the eyes of bars are far apart. And that means that the wind speeds will be lower, again, reflected in the station circle. Glasgow is at the cold front. So we would expect to see heavy cloud and heavy rain and stronger winds. And because that cold front is bringing cold air behind it, you would expect to see colder temperatures. So clearly, chart X is the correct one. Here's what the answer would look like. Glasgow has a low temperature because this cold front here is the front edge of a cold air mass and therefore it is dragging cold air behind it along these isobars. Therefore, anywhere that that cold front moves over is going to receive the cold air that the cold front is dragging behind it. Glasgow has a wind direction that's from the southwest. Consider the isobars and consider the location of Glasgow, which I will note with the red dot of my pointer here. If you imagine a north, south, east and west on this map, the isobars moving through Glasgow come from the southwest. I'll just let you process that. Here is the isobar. That isobar, that line there, if you were to put a compass point, if you were to draw a compass on the red dot of Glasgow, that isobar would come from broadly the southwest. And that's why the station circle tail is pointing from the southwest. The way to explain it is that Glasgow's wind direction is from the southwest because the wind blows anti-clockwise in, uh, in a depression or along the isobars. In a set question like this, it's sensible um, to talk about multiple locations. Don't just focus on Glasgow. So London has showers. Here's London. It has showers because of the light cloud at the warm front. Try not to say London has showers because of the warm front. That's not really a full explanation. 
London has light showers because the warm front that it is close to brings light cloud. That's the explanation of there being light rain, is, is the light cloud. London has a lighter wind speed because if you look at the isobars here, they are far apart. Where the isobars are close together, the wind is always faster. Where the isobars are further apart, the wind is always slower. I like to think of them like um, hose pipes, which is, sounds a bit weird, but you'll have all have had the experience of washing a car and putting your thumb over the end of the hose pipe and then spraying someone. Well, the reason the water gets faster as you close off the end of the pipe is because you've made the gap, you've made the space available for the water to move through narrower. So the water has to speed up to get through the gap. Well, here, the isopars are wide apart. There's a nice big gap for the air to flow through. So the air flows slowly. Here, the isobars are close together. The gap, which I'm asking you to imagine, is narrower and therefore the air moves more quickly. This isn't really a scientific explanation, but it's quite a nice way to imagine it to understand it better. Lastly, Manchester is warmer. Here's Manchester. Manchester has a warmer temperature, not the warmest temperature, but nonetheless a warmer temperature uh, because it is in the warm sector. The warm sector is the area between the warm front and the cold front. So you can see, as long as you revise the basic principles of the cold front, the warm front, and the warm sector, these questions don't need to be all that challenging. Here's another example. This time we're asked to comment how the weather will be affected in Stirling over 24 hours. Well, we're going to talk about how that warm front is dragging the warm air mass behind it. The warm air mass makes up the warm sector air. So that warm air mass is dragging the warm air, sorry, that warm front is dragging the warm air behind it and that will make the temperatures go up for Stirling. Stirling will be affected by a cold front which will drag cold air behind it and that will make the temperatures go down in Stirling. The warm front will also bring light cloud and so there will be showers. The cold front will bring heavy cloud so there will be heavy downpours. For more advanced learners, the isobars are wider apart at the warm front, so the wind speed will be lower. The isobars are closer together at the cold front, so when the cold front passes over Stirling, the wind speed will increase. So you can see, here's our answer. The warm front will bring light rain because of light cloud. The warm front brings warm temperatures because it drags in the warm sector air. The cold front brings heavy cloud, so the rain will become heavy. The cold front will bring falling temperatures because it drags in the cold sector air. Notice again, I'm not just saying the cold front will bring cold temperatures because it is the cold front. That's not really a full explanation. The cold front drags cold air behind it, or pulls in cold air behind it, and that's why the temperature drops. The cold front will bring stronger winds because the isobars become narrower. Finally, the wind will blow from the west because the wind spot spins anti-clockwise in a depression. I've left this one to last because uh, candidates tend to find that that's a trickier mark to fully com comprehend. Um, this is a one, two, three, four, five, possibly six mark answer. And hopefully I've shown you that actually if you just break your understanding down into warm front, warm sector, cold front, really your answer doesn't need to be all that challenging. Why don't you have a go at this question and bring it in and get your teacher to mark it? Um, give reasons for the changes which the weather forecast predicts for Penzance. First step, find Penzance. Then read the forecast. For example, sunny intervals will give way to heavy showers. Winds at first strong will become lighter and more westerly. Temperatures will drop. Well, why will the temperatures drop in Penzance? The reason for that is, is that this cold front is going to move over Penzance and drag in the cold air from behind. The winds are at first strong, 
Well, let's compare those isobars. Are they narrower here or are they narrower here? Clearly they get wider and that would explain why the wind will become lighter. Okay, um, for four marks, see if you can answer that question. Lastly, we deal with anticyclones. Anticyclones are quite straightforward, really. Here's an example of a question. Give reasons for the weather conditions at Bathgate. So once again, we find Bathgate. Notice it has a station circle with um, one octave of cloud, a west, um, what appears to be a westerly wind, uh, minus two degrees temperature. Now, if you've understood the lesson I've just given you on depressions, or you've followed the basics of how to answer anyway, then this becomes very straightforward. The wind is gentle because the isobars are very widely spaced, as you can see. The wind blows from the west because anticyclones spin clockwise. Sometimes it's easier for you to remember this if you actually draw arrows on the isobars in your exam question paper. That will help you work out which direction the wind is coming from. A more complicated point is that there are no clouds in an anticyclone. The tricky thing is to explain why. Well, in an anticyclone, the air pressure is high. You can see the word high on the map. This means the air is falling towards the ground. Because the air is falling towards the ground, this means moisture is trapped on the ground. Moisture cannot escape up into the sky to create clouds. A simple way of expressing this is simply to say there are few clouds because of high air pressure. The temperature is low. Now be careful here. The temperature is low because it is winter. How do I know it's winter? Because I have read the question. There is almost always a date attached to weather map questions and the clever candidate is one who checks that date. The temperature is low because it is winter and there are no clouds to keep in the heat. If this date was like mid-June, then you would say you would find that the temperature would be higher and the temperature would be high because it is summer and there are no clouds to stop the sun's heat. There is obviously no rain because of the lack of clouds. It's easy to forget that mark because the station circle doesn't have anything showing any kind of rain. There's no symbol for it. But that means that there's no rain, and there's no rain because there's no clouds. A last little look at anticyclones would bring us to this question, where you're asked to describe the benefits and problems of an anticyclone in either summer or winter. So to simplify this for you, I'm going to put up the summer points and the winter points. Four marks of each. They're really straightforward. And this is about as easy as the air mass question where you're asked to talk about the benefits and negatives of a tropical or, ne or um, polar air mass. Essentially, they're about practicalities uh, in people's daily lives. So there's no clouds for shade, so it'll be warm, which will benefit tourism. The mark is scored for the no clouds and therefore no shade benefiting tourism. The link between the weather an anticyclone brings and something that humans do. The wind will be slow. There's the weather that an anticyclone brings, and therefore it's a good day out for picnics or any kind of activity that's good without wind. Uh, over in the winter column here, the, um, there will be few clouds, so no rain, perfect for sports and activities. Again, I'm linking the weather we find in an anticyclone to a suitable activity. The key thing to actually revise here is what weather do you associate with an anticyclone in summer and in winter. So make sure you can tell the difference. Okay, that is the entire weather unit in a nutshell, everyone. Uh, I strongly advise you watch this a few times. Um, make sure you take all the notes from every screen by pausing the video. Attempt the questions that you see on the screen. Don't just look at them, actually try them. You can get me to mark them. Um, and can also use your weather notes from your jotters and work booklets to support this revision. You'll also find videos elsewhere on my website. Okay, well done everyone.